My name is Till Tantel from the University of Lübeck and I'd like to present some new results on the satisfaction probability of KCNF formulas. This talk is to be presented at the Computational Complexity Conference. It's going to be the last talk of the day. And I think people are going to, well, actually uh, look forward to dinner at that point. So I thought I'd going to give this whole talk a sort of culinary twist. And because of that, instead of a normal uh, outline, we're going to have a talks menu. So I'm going to start with some starters, some fresh complexity results, which I guess will be new to most people. And um, these are going to give a sort of flavor of what is going to go on in the uh, main part of the talk. And the mains are going to be two new theorems, the spectral trichotomy theorem and the spectral well ordering theorem. And then the end is a sort of dessert. I'd like to round off all of this uh, with some uh, things that were sort of missing in the starters in order to give you a complete picture of what's going on. Let me begin by serving the starters. These are going to be new complexity results, but they're going to be very basic. Basic in the sense that you could actually teach them in an introductory course to theoretical computer science. So, um, what are the things we teach in such an introductory course? Well, you talk about automata, formal languages, recursion theory, PNP, and then sort of the crowning result is usually this. Cook's theory fits nicely with the motto of this talk, namely telling whether a uh, 3CNF formula has a satisfying assignment, telling whether there exists such an assignment that is NP complete. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, by 3CNF formula, I mean a formula in conjunctive normal form with at most three literals per clause, something like that. Okay, now I'm going to use this uh, well-known theorem to smuggle in some notations. So let me rewrite this as uh, the set of all 3CNF formulas where the probability taking over all possible assignments to the variables of phi, that such an assignment makes phi, uh, makes phi true, that is greater than zero. Um, that because this talk is about satisfaction probabilities, this is um, what we're going to look at in a very often. And because we need it so often, let me abbreviate like that. So probability of phi, but that here phi is not a random variable. The random variable is not even shown, it's a B term. This is just the um, so, satisfaction probability that a random assignment taken uh, uniformly makes the formula true, or by the way, it's the same as the number of satisfying assignment divided by two to the number of variables. So that is uh, three sat. And in this talk, uh, actually I'm going to write like three sat prop greater than zero. So that's the question uh, we have there. And this is a well-known theory. Now for some fresh results. And the fresh result concerns the question of telling whether exactly half of all assignments of a 3CNF formula are satisfying. So how difficult is that? So not just, just some satisfying, but exactly half of them. Seems like an interesting problem. And the surprising answer is that is NL complete. That is complete for non-deterministic logarithmic space and let me just rewrite this in this notation, that the set of all three CNF formulas for which the satisfaction probability, probability of phi, is exactly one half, and, and this is going to be called three sub prop equals one half, that problem is NL complete. Okay, that's interesting. But it gets even a little bit spicier if we move on to four CNFs. So for four CNF, well, certainly, you know, telling whether four set, uh, yeah, well, uh, four sat prop e greater than zero, that's four sat, that's certainly NP complete. But what about four sat prop equals one half? So 0.50%. So how difficult is that? So for three CNF it was NL complete, and this turns out to be, well, co-NP complete, which is interesting. And what about other values? So what about 25%? So how difficult is it to tell whether the satisfaction probability of a Four CNF formulas exactly 25%. Not 26, not 24, exactly 25. That is also co NP complete. Well, what about 75%? There it's NL complete once more. Okay, so this is already spicy and strange, but perhaps something's going on there. So down here in the, in the lower part, we have hard uh, uh, instances, and perhaps up there, they are the easy ones. But Let's look at 49%. So what about that? And force that probability equals 49% just below. That's actually a trivial problem. 
but the reason is not so nice or uh, it's not so cool uh, because actually the answer is always no. There are no formulas that have a satisfaction probability of exactly 49% for more or less technical reasons. More interesting is 0.49281875. Uh, this satisfaction probability, that's NL complete. Okay, so to round this off, uh, I put in the in this equal setting, equal zero down there, that's then co-NP complete, telling me that it has no satisfying assignments. And up there, telling me there's a tautology, that's very easy for a CNF formula. But what we see here is that the complexity of these problems sort of jumps around in very weird ways. And I hope you are now uh, a little bit hungry for the main results and have uh, sparked your interest in this. Let me now serve the first of the two main courses of this uh, talk, namely the spectral trichotomy theory. This theorem is actually the main result of this paper, and it's a trichotomy. I'm going to talk, talk about spectral in a moment. It says the following. For every k and every p, what we just looked at, telling whether k c in a formula has a satisfaction probability of exactly p. That is, well, always one of the three things we just saw. It's either co and p complete, it's nl complete, or it lies in AC0, and nothing else can happen. At this point, let me point out, um, if you look at a very similar problem, namely k sub prop greater than or equal to p, that has been studied by Akmal and Williams. They presented uh, very nice results on that at Fox just a few months ago, and they showed that this problem can actually be solved in polynomial time for every rational p. And actually, they even show it can be solved in linear time. So that has a low complexity in some sense. And also note that it's very important that we have this bound k on the size of the clauses. If you don't bound that, if you just look at arbitrary CNF formulas or propositional formulas, then telling such prop equals to one half, telling whether satisfaction probability is equal to one half, that is c equal p complete, a class much higher up, and telling whether it's greater than or equal to two, uh, one half, or even telling whether it's strictly greater than one half, that's all the same complexity, that is PP complete. So these are much higher up there. Fixing K, bounding the clause size, really has a strong effect on the uh, satisfaction, on the complexity of these results. Okay, let's sneak into the kitchen. I'd like to show you a little bit how this is done, talk a little bit about the proof, uh, how do you prove this theory. And for that, I'm going to present something I call the cooling algorithm only for this talk, with the intuition being that, you know, we have here satisfaction probability 100%. Think of this as 100 degrees Celsius, boiling water, zero degree freezing. And the cooling algorithm is going to take an input formula phi, where k is now fixed, think of k equals 4, p is fixed like one half or one quarter. And now what we want to tell is, is the satisfaction probability of phi now below p, at p, or above p. Um, which one is the case? Actually, we only care whether it's equal to p or not, but the algorithms, this cooling algorithm, is actually going to tell us which of the three is happening. And what does it do? Well, why it's called cooling? You, you take your formula, and while this formula is, does not yet have constant size, and so if it's not very simple, then go ahead and replace it by a cooler version, meaning something have a possibly having a slightly uh, smaller satisfaction probability. So perhaps we start here. Now we don't know where we start. I mean, this is what this all is all about, computing the satisfaction probability. But suppose we start here and then we cool, and then we go down a little bit. We may actually stay at the same place uh, if we do this replacement. And then we do another step, another step, another step, until we wind up with a formula that has constant size. And that uh, thing is going to be called kappa in the following, like kernel. We might also have started down here and then do this uh, step and then wind up here. Or we might have started here and wind up at P uh, itself. Or we might have started somewhere and not moved at all. That is also an option. Um, the cooling has no effect. We, after some steps, wind up at the formula that has uh, constant size. So that's what the uh, cooling algorithm will do. Now, I haven't told you anything how it works in detail, but there's one observation we can make, um, some, something very simple. Observe that the last uh, kappa that we, this constant side things, that probability we can compute because it's constant, you just look it up. So what you can do is look at the last one. If that is above P, well, then certainly the original formula also had a satisfaction probability above P. 
If it ends up at P, then things are a little less clear that it might have been above or it might have been there and we didn't move, but at least we know it has been at or above P. But if you wind up below, then it's totally unclear. Then we might have been above, below, who knows? Uh, then we don't really know what's happening. So that looks like the very bad case. And actually, we're going to need the second main dish of this talk. But it, this is going to be resolved very simply. It's actually more the uh, central case that is hard. Anyway, so this is something we know without knowing how the algorithm this um, uh, cooling step works. And now let me show you a little bit more about the cooling. So what's the setup? We have a formula phi, like a 4CNF like this one, which is big, too big. And what we do now, we look for sunflower. So what's a sunflower? It looks like this. And a sunflower, um, actually mathematically speaking, it's a subset of the clauses such that in this subset, all of them have certain literals in common. In this case, it's A or not B. And they are called the core of the sunflower. So they all have that in common. And outside the core, uh, that's called the petals, and they are, in this case, 12 petals, and they are variable disjoint outside. So all of these clauses share certain variables outside. Um, they're completely variables disjoint. And now what we do, petal plucking procedure, we pluck the petals. So we just throw away all these petals, and um, that is going to be our next formula. So just remove that. And then repeat. Look for a new sunflower. We're going to find one down here. It actually has a slightly larger core. This is all of them share this core. Otherwise, they're completely variable disjoint. And then pluck the petals. And now in this one, we don't find any more sunflowers. So that is going to be our final formula. That's it. I mean, that's the procedure. Look for sunflowers, pluck the petals. Uh, that's it. The obvious question is, why should we do this? I mean, what's the effect of doing that? And there's a simple observation, namely, it's pretty hard to satisfy a sunflower without satisfying the core. If you satisfy the core, which you have to do after plugging, then you certainly satisfy everything. But it's also possible to satisfy a sunflower like this one without actually satisfying the core, because if you satisfy C or D, and you have a three-quarter chance of doing that, and also satisfy E or not F, where you have, uh, again, a three-quarter chance of doing that, and then G or not H, three-quarter fold, and so on, then you can also uh, satisfy the sunflower. Only, as you can see, that probability goes down very quickly, to be precise. In general, plugging the petals from a sunflower can lower the satisfaction probability only very slightly. Namely, um, this is actually the uh, probability that a single clause, a single petal, uh, can be satisfied is at most this. And because they are all variable disjoint, meaning independent events, the number of petals sort of lowers the satisfaction probability very, very quickly. So this is the maximum uh, possible change in satisfaction probability that you can have because you just pluck the petals. Uh, we can rewrite this slightly like this, and that gives us a bound on how strong we uh, change the satisfaction probability. And note, the more petals you have, the smaller the change is going to be. In the second observation, this is called the Erdős sunflower lemma. And that says, okay, give me any number of petals you desire, like 12 and any k. Then the moment your formula has more than k, fact so four factorial times 24 ways to the power of four something, many clauses, there is a sunflower. You're always going to find one. So if we put that back into the cooling algorithm, what we notice is you start with your case in a formula. You compute a number h depending on the desired step size epsilon uh, that, so that the sunflowers are large enough such that if you do this collapsing, then um, here, the plug the sunflower, leave the core, then the satisfaction probability is going to lower by at most that, um, which is going to be smaller than epsilon. On the other hand, because of the outer sunflower lemma, if you have if you do not stop, you still have too many uh, petals, uh, sorry, too many clauses in the, in the uh, formula. And the other way around, once you stop, you are going to have at most that many uh, clauses, meaning that you can just look up the probability in the table. 
Okay, so we now know that we now have a concrete algorithm to do this cooling that always starts somewhere, does the cooling, and then if you wind up above P, you were above P. If you wind up at P, you were at or above P. And if you wind up below, who knows what's going on. And that is going to be now the uh, second main course that we have to look at. What are we going to do in this case? How are we going to address that? So let me... Now, so the second uh, main course of this talk, the spectral well-ordering theorem. Um, this theorem is about the spectrum of satisfaction probabilities that KCNF formulas can have. So if you're given a KCNF formula and say a 4 CNF formula, what are the possible values that uh, the probability can have? And order, in order to approach this question, perhaps let's start with 1 CNF formulas, which are very easy, because then, well, what are the possible values? Well, you can ha have one half, because that's a very simple 1 CNF formula, but also certainly the satisfaction probability of 25%, you know, A and B, it's just a quarter satisfaction probability, and uh, also 1 eighth, and so on. So in general, we have this, any number of the form 2 to the minus n uh, is going to be a possible satisfaction probability of a 1 CNF formula, and also 0 because a and not a, that is also a possibility. Okay, that's very easy, and observe that there are gaps in there. I mean, up here, or here, or here, or here. Gap meaning there's a whole interval, and they're all over the place, that does not contain a number that is the satisfaction probability of any one CNF formula. And that is going to be called a spectral gap in the following. Now they get smaller and smaller and smaller, and yeah, that's it. So observe they are all over the place. Now the more interesting case is now the 4 CNF spectral. Uh, for CNF spectrum, here it's already much more complex. You know, it starts uh, up much higher, and there are many more possibilities up there, and it basically looks like this. So some gaps there, and then it gets very, very dense. But there are gaps up there. I mean, that's the first observation. So uh, note that, for instance, even the 4 CNF spectrum, no formula um, will have a satisfaction probability that is strictly between 15 over 16 and 1. The reason is very simple. The moment you have a single clause, like A or B or C or D, that already lowers your satisfaction probability to 15 over 16, and then adding more clauses is just going to uh, go down. So I'm going to call this the spectral gap with respect to four CNFs of the number 1. So that is going to be the size of the interval below 1 uh, that doesn't contain any satisfaction probabilities of four CNFs. And that has a certain size, in this case, actually uh, 1 over 16, and that is greater than 0. But also, if you go down to 15 over 16, there's also a spectral gap there. That's also, um, they have to think a little bit longer, but it's 1 over 32, and that's also positive. And perhaps yet another example, take the number 0.97, so 97%. There's also a spectral gap below that. And uh, even though this is not even part of the spectrum, but still, there's a whole interval below that that does not uh, contain any satisfaction probability of four CNFs. Okay, well, why is this interesting? So what's so hot about these the spectral gaps? And for that, well, let's stay with k equals four. Now let's go down to, say, one half. And suppose there is a spectral gap there. So it's not dense, so there's something. If there is one, it's certainly not going to look like this. It's going to be much, much smaller. But suppose there is a spectral gap down there. Okay. Now, remember this cooling algorithm. Uh, what did it do? It started somewhere and it did lots and lots and lots of small cooling steps and went down until it ended up with some number kappa. I claim that this step that goes over the spectral gap is impossible. So I claim that the satisfaction probability is going to get stuck at P. And the reason for that is very simple. It's called the no-tunneling lemma in the uh, paper. It's a little bit like quantum theorem, where you have an electron that has an energy level, and then something is forbidden in the middle, and then it can sort of tunnel through this uh, gap, this energy gap. And here our formulas can't. If you have two formulas whose satisfaction probability is so near to one another that it's smaller than the spectral gap, then certainly both of them are either above P or below p, but it can't be one above and one below. It's simply impossible because then one of them would have a satisfaction probability in the spectral gap. 
And that means that in reality, if you start above p, this cooling algorithm will end at p. And that in turn means, in order to decide whether you are above or below p with your original satisfaction probability, it just suffices to do the cooling and look at the final formula. If that's above p, you were at or above p, you were at or above p originally. If you were below, then you're going to end up below. And that means that now suddenly k sub prop greater or equal to p, telling whether that's the case, uh, telling whether the satisfaction probability is at least p, that's actually an AC0. You can implement this cooling algorithm with some tricks in AC0. So the to answer the question why these spectral gaps are interesting, whenever there is a spectral gap, this problem is easy. Okay, and so now we have the uh, spectral well-ordering theory which says there are gaps everywhere. So for every k and every p, there's always a spectral gap uh, with respect to the k scene of spectrum. So that's the uh, result, which just tells us what we had, uh, this result of Aqua and Williams, just follows from that, uh, because the cooling algorithm is always going to work. Okay, so a few words on, on this. So first of all, why it's called the well-ordering theorem, why not the spectral gap theorem? Because um, this statement is actually equivalent in terms of uh, basic set theory to the spectrum is well-ordered by the greater than relation. But that's just why uh, where the name comes from. The proof is actually surprisingly simple of this result. So um, it's just basically one and a half pages in the, in the, in the proceedings, uh, because all you have to do is you do a simple induction starting with k equals 1. We had that. That was where we had gaps all over the place, so that's easy. And then you um, notice that these well-orderings, these things where there are spectral gaps everywhere, they have many closure properties. For instance, if you have a well-ordering, take a subset, then you still have a well-ordering because that just makes gaps bigger. If you do a union, then the gaps get smaller, but there are still gaps. If you take the sum, well, then you have to argue a little bit more that uh, you still get to have gaps all over the place. And then what you show is, if you have a case in a formula, that you can uh, just express this satisfaction probability as a sum of satisfaction probabilities of k minus 1, and then applying the closure properties gives you the result. That's basically it. So it's a surprisingly simple result, and that sort of wraps up what we need. Um, this case, we can't tunnel through the spectral gap, and leaving only, now for dessert, the question is what happens if we are at p, but this below p thing is now solved because there are spectral gaps all over the place. Now for the dessert, I would like to return to the starter, because there's something still missing in some sense. We call that the original first claim I made is that 3 such probability equals 1 half is NL complete. And we can do already do a lot about this result. Um, so here's our algorithm. Well, we start with our input formula, 3CNF, then we do this cooling stuff, and then you wind up with uh, a final kappa. And if the probability of kappa is above p, we know it's not equal to uh, p. If it's below p, we actually also know that the original one must have been below because of the spectral gaps. But what about if it is really equal to p, to one half? Then it's, we don't really know what to do. Observe um, to be equal to one half. Actually, this kappa must look essentially like a unit clause. It can be more complex, but that's basically it. And now what we still need to do is somehow find out, did we actually lower the satisfaction probability in any of these steps? So did it really go down or were we already at kappa? And to do that, we need to find out, did we lose any satisfying assignments? So is there an assignment of phi that does not make kappa true? And this can be found out as follows. Now, this looks a little bit intimidating, but actually what you just do, you go over all possible assignments to the variables of the core that do not make, uh, sorry, of kappa, and that do not make kappa true. And then you check whether what remains, this is phi restricted to beta, whether that is satisfiable, because then you've found another satisfying assignment. So just to give you an example how that works, you have a 3CNR formula. You do your thing with the sunflower plugging and uh, you plug them away. And then what remains, that's kappa. And here we have this not A, uh, this is going to be our kernel. And then we now have a look at formulas, uh, assignments that make this kappa not true. So that would be assigning, for instance, um, A to true. And then what sort of remains, that phi restricted to beta, that's a 2CNF formula. And there's no coincidence because kappa will always contain a formula that uh, is here 
It has at least one literal, so what remains can be at most two literals. That's basically the idea. So in general, what turns out is that these kappas, the variables in this kappa, they are always a backdoor into two CNFs whenever the spectral uh, trichotomy theorem says so, and uh, they are even a backdoor into one CNFs if this spectral trichotomy theorem claims membership in AC0. Okay, so sort of this was a lot to digest, I guess, and as in a restaurant, I'm going to give you something in a doggy bag to take home. Uh, there are three things that you may have wished to have a look, another look at. The spectral trichotomy theorem, it says that for all k and p, telling whether k c in a formula has a satisfaction probability exactly p, it is current p complete or nl complete or lies in AC0. One particular case is for three CNFs telling whether exactly half of the assignments are true, that's nl complete. And this uh, spectral well ordering theorem says that for all k and p, we have a positive spectral gap, and this is sort of where all of that follows from. And perhaps a final pretty fur to something to uh, sweet to eat. Um, certainly, you can look beyond this, and for instance, you can also look at constraint satisfaction problems with finite domains and finite arities, and turns out all of this stuff also works. And you can also, for instance, look at the algebraic setting, and there it turns out that at least you get some new insights, namely whenever things are well ordered uh, below where the spectral gaps are available, then these ideas can also give you new insights and new results there.